Welcome to another episode. I am the and this is the Sussex set. Yes, I am back with another episode. As always, I hope you guys are well and thank you so much for tuning in. Wow, a lot has happened since the last episode. <laughs> I feel like that was just a few days ago. A lot has gone down. Hopefully we've all th- had the chance to uh, digest season four of The Crown and Shout out to Netflix because it's a good month for Netflix and all uh, Netflix subscribers. Isn't it uh, Isn't it funny how when Megan got her deal, so many people were saying, oh, well, I'm going to cancel my Netflix because, oh, my God, this is not what I signed up for. And they watching The Crown, too. So, <laughs> so much for those plans. But we knew they were empty plans anyway. But yes, Netflix is having a stellar month. And, you know, I should have known something was a brewin when the family started to make such a big fuss, like right before it hit. Such a big fuss was made about this season. And I'm going to get into why I think that is, because I have a theory. It's like the Finding Freedom book. And how everybody was releasing a statement about, oh, well, this is actually not true. Right before it dropped. It's like that, but like on steroids. Because this is the crown we're talking about. But one thing I know for sure is that Archie is going to be eating good for the rest of his days. Because Netflix is going nowhere. We know Netflix pays very well. And we can all see how they can afford to. I saw a front page cover of, there were many, by the way, but the one I happened to see said that the palace is furious over TV's The Crown, furious at Netflix and basically saying that Netflix is trolling the royal family now or the writers or the creators of the show trolling the royal family Now, we've seen this whole, the palace trying to position themselves as the victim from really day one of when Megan joined the family, ever since at least our community has been paying attention. They love to say, never explain, never complain, never complain, never explain. But they do, and they do it a lot, and they have done it for their entire existence, but especially here lately. Because keeping in mind, we live in an age where communication is key. So the message that you put out, the message that is surrounding your entity, uh, the narrative that is surrounding your entity, your group, your brand, that matters. And so communication is far more important now than let's say 50 years ago. So they're doing a lot of complaining, a lot of explaining. One thing that we've always noticed is how they do the complaining and the explaining for those that they want to protect. So I've said it here before. They explained a lot about hair extensions and Botox and uh, there were lawyers gotten when rumors of an affair uh I believe Will said that his human rights were being violated. Really, the list just goes on and on and on. They didn't do a whole lot of explaining and protecting of Megan, though. Uh, Harry did. Because he's her right or die. And we, we, we love that about him. Harry did. But now that the royal family is on the skewer, and not just, you know, for a day or two, This is in front of the world where the world is basically seeing them for we all kind of know them to be exactly who they are, which is exactly how they were portrayed. People are saying, oh, well, this is fake. This is the details might be fiction, but the overall story, the overarching narrative that surrounds the British royal family, that is not fiction. And we all know that. But for the world to sit and watch and to have a conversation about what we're seeing, yes, it is a show, but people are not stupid. 
And we all saw these events play out before our eyes because now the crowd has moved into an age where those of us that are alive and watching the show, like probably the majority of us, we have memories of that time. We saw interviews of Diana talking about, or at least that one interview, talking about her experience in the royal family. And we get to compare what we know to how the writers and creators of the show interpreted that and are presenting that. So the whole, they're trolling the royal family and the palaces, upset about the portrayal of the royal family in this season of The Crown. That was all preemptive. People don't have the restraint that they once had, especially this year. They don't have the restraint or the patience, especially when they don't have the same amount of respect that they might have had for the royal family. Let's say in 2017, before Meghan became the Duchess of Sussex. But the fact that we got to see Harry and Meghan's saga play out in the last couple of years and seeing all those parallels between what happened now and then what happened with Diana, you can try to do all the preemptive outrage you want. Nobody is picking up what you're putting down, royal family. So that's always going to be interesting to me. So much explaining, but not a whole lot of saying of anything because you can't say anything about what we know happened. And here's what I want to know. Why now? Like, why is the royal family so outraged at the crown now? Why are they so outraged by this work now? It's not like there haven't been other fictional depictions of the royal family. There have been many books. There have been films, documentaries, television shows. Surely this wouldn't be the first to cast them in a harsh light. And the crown has been around for a few years now. And the royal family even boasts about watching it, or they have in the past. Oh, yeah, well, of course we watch the crown. Because you want to show that you're relatable, that you can watch the crown, even if it is about your own institution. But see, you like to see yourself on screen. You like to see this institution that you're a part of being glorified and beautified on screen. That feeds the ego. After all, you get to be a part of this institution that the world watches and admires. And this critically acclaimed show, which is so well written, so beautiful, depicts your family. So, yeah, we watch The Crown. That's always been the refrain from the royal family. Never a bad word to say about it. Not one. Until this season, same show, same critically acclaimed writing and, and performances. All of a sudden, it's an issue, though. Why? Because the crown is not so kind to them like it had been. And truthfully, how can it be? And while it's not kind, it's not exactly unkind. It's just honest. And that's what the royal family has failed to reckon with. The world having an honest look at that institution, at their relationships, at how they regard one another, and particularly how they regard outsiders. Because again, you're living history. The receipts are always going to be there. The receipts are unfolding in real time. But with season four of The Crown, the world is watching in unison. And that is what has them completely unnerved. Never has there been a time when the world could watch a show together. It's no longer the distance that you can put between yourself and the people's opinions of you, you know, as a royal family member. No, people are going to at your Twitter. People are going to at you, Clarence House. <laughs> like when they see that scene of you yelling at Diana because Camilla decided that she was too ugly to be liked by the people of England and Charles took offense and got mad. They're going to at you, Clarence House, and say, Charles, how could you? <laughs> Even if the dialogue is fiction. People these days don't care. 
And the youth will constantly try you because that's what they do for fun. And don't forget this year, they're bored. So the royal family has never, ever, ever been in this type of climate. Not as hostile as this one, but it's what they deserve. And of course, this season is all about Diana and Margaret Thatcher, but mostly Diana. You know, that's the one that people really show up to see in this season. And she's still the queen of people's hearts. Don't get it twisted. She might have been dead for a while, but she's one of those people who people that weren't even alive when she died know who she is because of how their parents and grandparents feel about her, or at least their moms and their grand grandma feel about Diana. You get to know her because of, you know, the affection that people have for her. Being able to see acted out the type of treatment she received when she was such a young girl. It has people in their feelings. And the seemingly sweet old grandpa that Charles likes to make himself out to be in 2020, it's not sitting well. (laughs) It's not sitting well with a lot of people because the portrayal of him is so good. God bless all of those actors. They're incredible. But the portrayal is so good and so convincing. I mean... It gels with everything I ever assumed about their relationship, especially with what Diana said herself about their relationship and the torment that she experienced in her marriage. So no, instead, Charles gets to be portrayed as the jealous husband, someone who is so jealous of everyone else because he never did get enough praise or so people say. And after this show, I wonder whether people will actually see him as an emotional imbecile. And that's not me trying to be offensive. That's me saying he doesn't have a whole lot of emotions, as we see from so many people in that family. And I'm not even talking about the show. I'm just talking about the last few years from what I have observed. I've been watching pretty closely. He is someone who has waited his whole life to matter. And to be somebody. Because he went from being jealous of his wife, his new wife who got all this positive attention, to then being jealous of his sons, who basically, as they began to do their own engagements as young adults, got all the attention that Charles wishes he would have gotten. So he never really did get it. He got it before he got married. You would think that for a man that would be enough. Like, you don't, you don't really need to be pat on the head like a dog ever so often just so you can see yourself as worthy, do you? I think, unfortunately, in Charles's case, he does. Not good qualities for a king. People have said that for so many years. But in The Crown, we get to see it depicted. It's not Netflix's fault that the receipts are what they use for their research. Because Charles's insecurity has been very well documented. So many of the events that we saw in this season or in the show in general have all been very well documented. And if you notice, it was largely his team, his aides, saying things in the papers about how dissatisfied they were with this season of The Crown. Charles's team. Not really anybody else's. Charles's. And I think another thing that unnerves the royal family is that we all get a glimpse of how they operate as an institution. I feel like I know, but the average person who's just sitting down to watch Netflix because they heard the show is good and everybody's talking about it, they get to see how they operate as an institution. And that scares the royal family. Do we need them at all? They fear that question. Irrelevance is their enemy. But when they're depicted as the villain, that question shoots straight to the top. Because why would you want to have people like that? Why would you want to tax fund people like that? 
And not just this year, but like every year. Why would you want to do that? That's why they're always trying to present themselves as wholesome, as loving, as, you know, one of the people. But it can't work because you're not one of the people. It would be different if they were the royal family, but they didn't treat everyone else in their family like dogs. That would be different. I'm sure there may be royal families that people absolutely love because they feel like they're good people. I think, you know, I don't know if Sweden has one, but there's one where uh, someone else came in as an outsider and they weren't shunned. And they live normal lives and they have regular jobs. Okay, that's fine. But this royal family, they act as if they're above everything. Like they're many gods. But they fool you into thinking that they actually care about about you if you're a citizen if you're a taxpayer or a member of the commonwealth because that's another thing they fear is other commonwealth countries deciding yeah we don't really need you we're good and i still think one by one countries are going to come to this conclusion that they're good they don't they don't want the queen as their head of state I think another thing the royal family fears is being confronted with the way they treated Diana and seeing that depicted in front of the world. And can we just say the actress that portrayed Diana did such a great job? Like, that's an understatement. She knocked it out of the park. Like, there were moments that I forgot that that wasn't Diana. She was she was that good. And I've seen so many Diana videos and clips and things like that. She was amazing. So endearing, really, from start to finish. And she was very easy to have sympathy for. And sympathy for her character and her character alone. <laughs> Again, especially looking at the last couple of years because one would think that they learned their lesson. I'm sure, I'm sure they don't want to see the portrayal of Diana or Diana be, basically being brought back to life. But one would think that they would have learned from that. And now we have proof that they didn't because they're not trying to. Again, they fear being seen for who they truly are. Which are straight up monsters. By the way, something that was brought to my attention uh, by Kim, Kim Metal Guitars on Twitter, go give her a follow, which I found hilarious is that Charles's birthday was on the 14th of November. The crown came out on the 13th. And literally <laughs> everybody was talking about Diana. So he got to be overshadowed on his own birthday again. Just like she did when she danced uh, to Billy Joel in Uptown Girl. She did that in real life. They didn't question the validity of that. <laughs> um, you love to see it. You love to see it. Remember he told her off in the car? What a jerk. What a jerk. But the fact that he got overshadowed this time too, it's what the girl deserves. So shout out to Diana. Another thing this season of The Crown did for me was draw even more parallels between Meghan and Princess Diana. And this is in ways that I hadn't really thought about before. The thing that makes Diana and Meghan so similar is that they both rejected the royal family in a way, like in their own way. When they saw that Diana was not going to shrink away after having her kids and producing the heirs, but that she was going to stand and find her voice and stand in her, her popularity, which was hers. It wasn't really for anyone else. There was a reason people had the reaction for her that they didn't have for literally anyone else in the royal family and that she would stand in that. When they saw that, they could see that she was rejecting their values and how they operated as a family, how they treated each other, how they regarded themselves in relation to that very public. And she wasn't going to play that game. They saw that. So she rejected, even though she is, she's more English than them. And even though she's from an aristocratic background, she wasn't easy to mold. 
They thought that she would be for that reason, but she wasn't. She rejected what they stood for. She went into it blindly, not really knowing what she was getting into because she was so young, but she ultimately rejected that crap. And for her part, Megan did it too. But she got to reject them in a new way. And I would imagine the royal family doesn't like being rejected. But see, here's where Megan's rejection burns. She rejected their values as well. Because Megan doesn't operate the same way they do. Really, Harry doesn't either. But what they, the family, and the monarchists can't quite stomach for how Megan rejected them was that Megan is a complete outsider. And she rejected all their grandeur. And the question is, how can this non-white, American, non-aristocratic woman who is a descendant of slaves reject their way of life? She offended the hell out of the royal family. And rightfully so. You can have all the estates you want. You can have all the horses. You can have all the palaces. You can get all the curtsies and the bows. But when you don't have any morals, you may as well be living in a slum. And that's why, that's precisely why I call it the ghetto, because it's a moral ghetto. You're surrounded in your own pain and poverty. And I bet when Megan took one look at that and she peeped that, it was decided, mm, yeah, I'm not going to last very long here. And I don't know if y'all remember, but Megan said from day one she wasn't impressed with the luxurious lifestyle. Or at least that's not what she wanted to be with Harry. She cared about whether he was kind or not. And when he proved to be kind, then that's when they hit it off. Megan was a self-made millionaire. So while she might not have tiaras and castles, where Diana didn't bring a whole lot of accomplishments into the royal family because she was only 19, mind you, look at what she did during her time in the royal family and what she was about to do after she left the royal family. Diana was a rock star. She revolutionized the role of a duchess in that context. And then Megan carried on with that before she left. I think people are coming to the conclusion that Megan, like Diana, had her own view of the world, her own convictions, and put forth the action to back it up. And the true successor, as long as she was going to be in that context, is Megan. It is not Kate. Even though Kate, I'm assuming, is going to be the Princess of Wales. I guess I'll give her that title. And obviously, with so much talk about Diana then causing people to look at Megan and to look at Kate in those roles where Diana is in, Really, Kate is the only one in the role that Diana was in. Because, again, Kate is the one who's going to be married to the Prince of Wales. Not Megan. But Megan was the one who was treated the same way Diana was, or mistreated, if you will. But you see, I have a theory on that, on just why that is. And it's because Kate... People love to say, oh, Megan is not like Diana. Don't dare compare Megan to Diana. Like Megan haters, they love to say that. But truthfully, don't you dare compare Kate to Diana. Hear me out. Not to be messy. <laughs> Tr truly, truly. But I honestly don't think Diana, and this probably should be something I probably shouldn't say, but I, I just honestly feel that I don't, I don't think Diana would have a whole lot of respect for how Kate is basically disappearing herself into this role. I think there would be understanding of it. You understand if, especially with Kate, because what is she going to do? I mean, like, what is she going to do if she's not a duchess? If she's not Will's wife, right? But 
completely disappearing herself into the role. Kate is made in the image of the monarchy, specifically her husband. And if you remember in The Crown, actually, I don't even know if this was in The Crown, or maybe maybe it was alluded to in The Crown, but it was also uh, something that was spoken about ex- explicitly in a lot of other documentaries about uh, Princess Diana and her marriage to Charles. Charles thought that because she was young and impressionable, that eventually she would basically mold into what he wanted her to be. Well, Kate came in ready to be that. Kate came in ready to be exactly what Will and the gray men and the palace wanted her to be. That's why they're always saying, because the family is in the bed with the media. The media is the one who is always saying, oh, Kate has never set a foot wrong. And in that way, maybe she is good for the monarchy because you see what the monarchy does with women who have opinions, women who know their self-worth women who are determined to fight for their own dignity and won't just be treated as a baby-making machine. But I'll even go further to say that Kate is not only not like Diana, I think she is the anti-Diana. And contrary to what people have said about her, I don't believe she's a modernizer at all. She's very traditional at least in in the way that she allows herself to be presented to the world in her role. Very, very traditional. Then Megan came along. Megan is bringing so much energy, so much new life to the institution. But the people who pull the strings behind the scenes, people whose names folks don't really know, they realize that you can't mold a woman who has already molded herself. You can mold Kate, even though Kate was 30. When she entered the institution, a full decade older than Diana was, Kate brought nothing, you know, to the table except except for her uterus, you know, whereas Megan brought a whole list of accomplishments. They tried to demean her and diminish her accomplishments to just being an actress. But Megan was a full is a full fledged philanthropist and she knows who she is, though. And that was very clear. So you can't make Megan into what you wanted her to be. And they saw initially that that was going to be an issue. Not because it's Megan's fault, but it's because it's the royal families and the institution's refusal to adapt to the times. So when that became clear, I feel like they did everything in their power to make Megan's life a living hell like they did Diana. Now, you know, the show doesn't say or doesn't depict them actually making her life a living hell. They just weren't listening to her. They weren't, they were basically ignoring her and hoping that everything would just work itself out when clearly she needed some help. They wanted her to be beaten to submission. And because they couldn't do it themselves, they were going to try to let the tabloids do it or eventually push them out and just hope that they would fade into oblivion. And have you noticed it's always the woman with personality who's not welcome in the royal family. It's never the man, whether the man is an outsider or he's an actual royal himself. He can have a personality. He can do what he wants to do. He can sow his oats if he wants to. But the women are expected to behave. The women are expected to do what they're told. And... Harry is really the most recent example of this that I can see. Harry, for the most part, got to do what he wanted to do as a young adult. Uh, When he did things that people found questionable, sure, they smacked him on the wrist, but they didn't do much else. You know, it's a lot of high-fiving for things that he might have been able to do that a woman wouldn't do or wouldn't be able to do in that same role. Regardless of what it is, whether it's running around naked in Las Vegas, which is fine. You know, that's what young people kind of do. They just do stupid stuff like that. A woman couldn't do that. But it's a sexist institution, so that doesn't surprise us. But when a woman just simply has her own opinions, her own convictions, that's the thing they're most focused on breaking down. And when they can break them down, they send them away in whatever way they can. Now, don't forget Harry was the favorite 
I still think he is the favorite. But Harry was always the favorite. Harry was the one that people love the world over. You see how happy we are to have him over here in America. We love Harry over here. But they love him over there too. But do you see how quickly they turned on him when he protected the woman that has the convictions, that has the opinions? He wasn't shunned until he showed that he was going to protect her. He wasn't going to do anything but protect her. See, because he, as a man of the royal family, what was he supposed to do? They were expecting him to do what Will does and how he treats his wife. What Charles did and how he treated his wife. When you're a member of the royal family, you're not supposed to protect your wife like that. You're not supposed to step in and say, that's hurtful to my wife and I'm not going to stand for it. Harry was supposed to be a team player. And so the family and the press and all the other monarchists, that's when they turned on Harry. And they wanted him to demand of his wife to bend to the way of the family and to forget herself and to lose herself. And they hate him again because he chose to protect the person that she is. Like he chose to protect her essence. He wasn't supposed to do that. And especially not for a woman of color. A woman of color who the world adores, who refused to be broken down by this powerful force that is the British royal family. So now they both had to go. Kate, on the other hand, is perfectly suited for the role of a prince's wife. And this is just to draw a modern day parallel. First of all, again, she wants to be there. She designed her whole early adulthood around stalking William. She wants to be there. By the way, there was another article that came out. I think it was L.com. They used that word. <laughs> they said she stalked him, which, you know, if the shoe fits, I mean, Listen, she went to the same place that he went for his gap year. She traveled there, too. And she, w she got into a better school than St. Andrews. But when it came out that Will was going to go to St. Andrews, she took the risk, threw all of that up in the air. She had her roommates and everything picked out and said, you know what? I'm going to go to St. Andrews. And so on and so forth. So many more examples of her doing everything possible to be in Will's uh, line of sight. And it worked. It worked. And that's the future queen, you know. So, again, I'm not piling on here. I know I say that all the time and I know some of y'all probably don't believe me, but I'm just drawing a parallel. She is exactly where she wants to be. So that that's my point right there. She's perfectly happy to be right where she is. And never at any point should you feel sorry for Kate. Truthfully, never feel sorry for her. Because she's the one who knows what she signed up for. Why do I think she's perfectly suited? Well, she doesn't have a personality. Her personality is whatever the gray men want it to be. It's whatever Will wants it to be. I might have said that already, but... I mean, it bears repeating. This is very important if you are to be a woman who succeeds in that institution. This is the only way you can succeed in that institution. And to be honest, she kind of reminds me of Vanessa Bell Calloway in Coming to America. If you haven't seen that movie, what are you doing? What are you doing? I mean, it's, it's honestly one of the best movies to have ever been made. But uh, she was going to marry Prince Akeem. And they hadn't been introduced. They didn't know each other from Adam. But he pulled her to the side and was trying to get to know her a little bit better before saying the vows. And he said, well, what do you like? Tell me about yourself. What do you like? Whatever you like. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite food? Whatever kind of food do you like. Literally. That's the impression that I get. He said, bark like a dog. And she barked like a dog. And I think it's that same willingness on Kate's part to never be in the wrong, to never set a foot wrong that keeps 
younger women, like women her age, from relating to her. And I feel like she literally offered herself up to be molded and for others to make their imprint on her, not the other way around. Kate wasn't going to change a thing. So when Megan showed up, being her own woman, having her own opinion, Kate didn't know what to do with that. And when Megan started catching all the heat from the tabloids, Kate sat back and she watched. And keeping in mind, as a woman, Kate had the most influential voice or potentially influential to step in and actually change the tide a little bit in Megan's favor. Do you remember how when they said, oh, Kate's basically showing Megan the ropes? No, she didn't. No, she didn't. She sat back and waited for Megan to fail because that's what the expectation was. Not a team player, this one, but she could have been. She could have garnered a lot more respect. She certainly, if that had been the narrative that came out of that camp after Harry and Megan had left, she certainly would be getting some praise now. Even if she didn't, you know, uh, speak out or wasn't super vocal if behind the scenes it had been determined that she was basically making sure that Megan doing everything she could to make sure that Megan uh, navigated through that tumultuous terrain okay as a mother then I would have been like yeah good on you Kate but that ain't what she did Kate was sitting back and snickering that's what I feel that's the image that I get people like to present her as Saint Catherine but she's not that at all. She's very cunning. And, and Pagan was the first person to actually bring this to my attention. She's very cunning. You don't have to be book smart to be cunning, to be someone who knows all the steps to take to get exactly what you want or the steps to not take to make sure that you stay ahead in the minds of the people whose opinions matter to you. So she was never going to be the type of woman to stick her neck out and say, hey, that's enough bullying of Meghan Markle. Because I don't know if you noticed, but Kate is one of them now. That is to say, if she comes out on the winning end of a comparison between both duchesses, then she will say and do nothing. Just like the family has done for years and years for the people that they would rather silence. Even if it means serious pain for someone like Megan. And let me reiterate, do not ever feel sorry for Kate. She is no Diana. And I think that the crown was great in demonstrating that historically, these people feel nothing. And this current bunch is no different. Truthfully, they're no different from what you see depicted on that show. Give or take a few details, like whether scenes happen exactly the way they show on the show or dialogue. Again, that's irrelevant. And in a lot of ways, the crown is being a little bit too nice. But the royal family has a constant, ever-present fear of being irrelevant or being seen as irrelevant by the public. Or the public just deciding one day that they don't need the royal family to rule over their lives. And any situation that threatens to upend their security in this idea that the public does in fact need them. Well, then they will see it as a problem. For example, Harry and Meghan's presence overshadowed not just the futures, but the future futures. That's an issue. If the global attention is with the non-heirs, then what do you need the heirs for? And the family knows that. So the Sussex exit was a solution to that problem. At least a temporary one, because Harry and Meghan are still in command of the global attention. That's not going to change. And it's really only going to get worse for the royal family. Another example, Diana overshadowing Charles. And Diana completely exposing the royal family in that Panorama interview. That was a big big problem. And at the time of her death, Diana was morphing into a global player herself, akin to what Harry and Meghan are now. The queen granted a divorce 
immediately because at the time of that interview with Martin Bashir, they were just separated. They had been separated for some years. The queen said, oh, yes, yeah, so you got to go. And she granted a divorce. And you know how hard that is for the queen. But that wasn't enough because Diana still commanded the headlines. She was engaged to a Muslim man. And they could not have the mother of a king being married to a Muslim man. I am in no way saying the royal family had anything to do with her death. But I'm also not saying they didn't. And one thing is for sure, Diana's death, it was a solution. Now, I know the Crown didn't talk about her death this season, but it was a solution. As a matter of fact, the Queen's cousin, Countess Mountbatten, called it just that. She said it was a tragic solution to a terrible problem. Now, imagine that. Imagine calling somebody's death a solution. But it turned out to be. And you can't exactly blame people who wonder whether the royal family had anything to do with her death because it was just too convenient. Could have very well been coincidental. Th those happen all the time. But it was mighty convenient, don't you think? I mean, so much so that you called it a solution. And imagine the type of things Diana would have said about how Harry and Meghan are being treated. And as Diana got older, she was really just coming into her own. As she got older and just starting to crystallize her worldview, you know, she had lost friends by that point. Oh, they weren't going to be able to tell Diana Spencer anything. And you know what? That would have been a major problem for them because people will take her word for it because they saw what she lived through. But her life ended. And then you have Nicholas, who was the czar of Russia. And I mentioned this before on the podcast. But you can go way back. His death was a solution. The death of him and his family. The queen's granddad. He sat back and watched his cousins be slaughtered by the Bolsheviks. Now, granted, he... He wasn't that great of a leader. So, I mean, I guess things are what they are. But that would be all fine and well if he hadn't asked his cousin, who, by the way, they said were more like brothers, uh, but the King of England, again, Elizabeth II's granddad, if he hadn't asked him for asylum in his country, in England, that went ignored that request. And so the Bolsheviks came and got him and his family and they killed him, you know. And I don't know if you noticed, but in the episode about the Queen's disabled cousins that had been hidden away, by the way, that was also a solution to a problem. But the Queen Mother, when Margaret begins to ask questions, she basically said that, you know, England was really the last surviving great monarchy out of all of the monarchies of Europe, England is the last great one to stand. Well, this would be part of the reason why. And soon after Nicholas and his family were killed, the English royal family changed their house name from Saxe-Coburg to Windsor. And that's why they're called the Windsors today. Because make no mistake, they're still German. They're German. All of the English, or rather European monarchies during that time were German. So it's all about the strategy. It's all about avoiding irrelevance. And then also at this time, the people in the streets of England were not all that hot on having a monarchy. They were very close to having their own uprising the way that there was one in, in Europe and in monarchies all across uh, Europe at that particular time. And so the cold-blooded murder of your own flesh and blood turns out to be the solution you need to keep going. Don't nobody else find that weird? I mean, we have instance after instance showing that these people 
they do not have feelings, or at least they don't. Sh- we know they don't show their feelings. But it's hard to even believe that they have them, given like the track record of sociopathic behaviors. But the irony is their sole job is to convince you that they do have those feelings so that they continue can continue to be taxpayer funded to convince you that they care about all these different charities that really don't typically have a net benefit of being associated with the royal family and those members of the royal family that do have feelings and are not afraid of their feelings they do not last because they have such an aversion to that sociopathic type behavior that they run for the hills. And the only reason the Edward and Wallace Simpson abdication fiasco didn't actually topple the monarchy back then is because the family could control the narrative much better at that time than they could in this modern age. If that happened today, and I know a lot of people try to make the comparisons between Harry and Meghan, First of all, Harry hasn't abdicated anything. He hasn't given up his place in the line of succession, not that he necessarily wants it, but that's not what his goal was. But also, Edward was the actual king at the time that he left. He had been coronated in everything. So people love to make that comparison, like Harry is the keys to the kingdom, like I said, because I guess technically he, well, not technically, but... In every other respect, he is. But this wasn't that. If that had happened, let's say if Will had done that, or if Charles had done that, I said, look, uh-uh, I'm, I'm not even trying to sign up for this life. It's not for me. We're going to go off and we're going to live somewhere else. We're going to go live in L.A. Because this ain't for us then the monarchy is done. It's a wrap on that. People are going to say, well, it was, it was good while it lasted. Now let's go ahead and just be a regular country. Now let's have a president. And that's it. And also Edward was ahead of his time in that application. And I'm not necessarily a fan of Wallace and Edward because at the end of the day, they were Nazi sympathizers. But he left for all the right reasons. And I'm not even talking about romantic reasons. He left because he saw that that was no way to live. It's just too bad that at that time there was really nothing else for him to do, to spend the rest of his life doing something that was meaningful. So, but if you look at Harry, Harry has many options in front of him. He and his wife, many options for how to live a life of meaning and how to still impact people beyond being a senior member of the royal family. And Harry also saw that that is no way to live. And I'm sure he said, I know if the king can abdicate and go on about his merry way, then certainly little old me being the sixth in line should be able to live my life how I choose without a whole lot of fuss. And, and it shouldn't have been a lot of fuss, but because they are so entitled, here we are. Now, I'll probably reference The Crown in future episodes because it's such a good season. It's a good show with so many parallels to what we have all been witnessing in the last couple of years. Uh, I have always enjoyed the beauty of the show. I mean, just generally the thoughtfulness behind their their choices, their casting choices. And who else noticed the motif of the color blue in this season. That was definitely a nod to both Margaret Thatcher and to Princess Diana. Both of those ladies wore blue very often. I guess Margaret wore it every day. Um, And of course, Diana's blue eyes. Her eyes were so expressive, but so thoughtful. I mean, I noticed it right away, but I just just loved that part particularly. Um, That motif itself but the writing is always beautiful effective and portraying the characters honestly Um, and the subtle shift of making the royal women bitter betties and drawing a distinction between diana and them i thought that was masterful 
the Queen Anne, Margaret, and the Queen Mother, they're the mean girls this season. And to me, that's like the equivalent of today's mean girls who are Kate and Camilla. Sophie, you can even throw her in there. Throw the queen in there too, girl, because it's her old operation. But um, queen may be a little bit more removed from it than than it was depicted in the crown uh, for Megan. But even still, we know the ones that have been did and the ones that haven't. But this is how I know Megan and Diana would have loads in common because Megan and Diana would have so much to talk about and that tea would be piping hot. And it makes so much sense that Megan got the ring that Diana bought for herself versus the one that the the famous engagement ring that Kate ended up having as her own engagement ring. I believe people are calling Megan's ring the freedom ring. Hey, here, here, let freedom ring, girl, because uh, it's a nice thing to have. But a lot of people don't know this, but Harry actually owned Diana's engagement ring. And when Will asked to use that as the ring he would propose to Kate with, Harry said, yeah, you can have it because I definitely won't be putting that on my wife's hand. No, nah, he probably didn't say that, but thank God he let Will have the ring because we don't want Megan to wear <laughs> to wear that ring. And to be honest, it's fitting that Kate is the one who wears it. And if you notice, she wears it quite proudly. Every chance she gets. But if that ring could talk, you want to know what I think it would say? <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Whatever in love means. I think that's what that ring would say. Because that's what it represents to me. That's what it represents to uh, all of the all of the Crown fans. So you can keep it, sis. Enjoy. Enjoy love. In other news, did you notice that the Daily Mail is back up to its uh, usual tricks as always? So we saw a headline from the Daily Mail that covers Harry's engagement in Compton, where he volunteered with a group of veterans, Compton veterans to be exact, and a group called the Walker Family Events Foundation. And that nonprofit empowers veterans across America to continue their service and find purpose through community impact and through helping others with veteran skills. A, we love that Harry is keeping in contact and building community with veterans wherever he goes. Uh, One thing you're going to know about America is we love our military and a lot of people serve in the military. You're going to find veterans everywhere you go. And uh, sadly, a lot of veterans, I don't know if it's the case in, in England, but in America, a lot of veterans are in a bad way. And I can only imagine the pandemic having an even worse impact on some uh, some situations, a lot of them are homeless. They may end up with substance abuse issues depending on their particular plight or even just getting out of the service, having a hard time finding employment uh, if the community they go back to doesn't have a whole lot of employment opportunities. So you're always going to find a lot of veterans groups like these groups, like the Compton, Compton Veterans And it's just so good to see Harry getting involved with that. I first came across this tweet where Omid was basically sharing the news of the engagement, but then basically saying, well, what do you know? The Daily Mail continues to be a hot mess with their racism and their bigotry. uh, Because what do you know? Compton, remember? Uh, They said that Megan was almost straight out of Compton. Well, today... Harry's first engagement in Compton, they say Harry's in the hood. You don't get to hide your racism because we see you for what you are. But like I said, a lot of people were under the comments. And really, at this point, it doesn't bother anybody because, A, again, they're out. They're safe. But then also, you know, the Daily Mail is also getting sued, or at least the parent company is getting sued (laughs) by Megan. Um, And then also, that's just what they do. But 
truthfully, they're just trying to get a rise out of folks because they know it's going to create buzz, anything to trend, whether it's good or bad. Uh, They want those initial clicks. So that's where I was just kind of like saying to people, which I I think most people get it anyway. The Daily Mail, they're going to do the Daily Mail, but they're trying to get people riled up. And the danger for them is when people no longer care. And that day is fast approaching. And of course, they change their headline to uh, or the big black and white letters on the picture to something else, something completely benign, (laughs) like completely benign. Now, I honestly would love to believe that Harry and Meghan never come across these headlines. But if they do... When they see them, I hope they laugh. Like, I hope they get a hearty laugh out of it. Because the stretching that Daily Mail is trying to do. I mean, they're trying to do the absolute most to get a topic to trend, to get it to be controversial in other news sources or news publications so that everybody else can hear about it and then go find the, you know, the article and maybe write a comment. They're trying so hard to get that. And the only thing they're doing is like making Harry even more likable. And at this point, Harry is just going to get invited to all the cookouts. They have no idea how accustomed to seasoned food this man has become. He is not coming back. He may come back for funerals, I'm sure. But beyond that, I can't really see him coming back anytime soon, especially with the Rona. So he's chilling in the hood with his Netflix money, shh money. And no, he's not actually going to give the Netflix money back. Daily Mail, as much as y'all try. I mean, I saw that. Somebody mentioned that in the comments in the last video. Yeah, I came across an article. They're begging Harry to give the money back, especially with the crown. Oh, how dare Harry take money from a... A company that trashes his family. Oh, how dare he? He should give it back and make a statement. Girl, ain't nobody finna give $150 million back. And that should prove to y'all they hate seeing Harry rich. Like they hate seeing him with money. An inheritance is one thing, but being loaded is another. And he and Megan are loaded Yeah, they want him to give it back. They want him to come back to England and suck from the teat, even though they complained about Frogmore Cottage and they complained about, you know, all of the taxpayer funded clothes or what have you. I don't even know that they were funded by taxpayers, but they complained about the private jets and all of it. They want that more than they want Harry and Meghan having one hundred and fifty million dollars, possibly two hundred and fifty million They are sick over that Netflix deal. They want Harry and Meghan to suck from the teat just like they do. The other royals do. Because bitterness probably doesn't even begin to describe what they're feeling. But you know, Harry's just chilling in the hood with his homies. Rolling with the homies. Because Harry's still the sexiest royal alive. Yep. And he's still the most influential probably behind the queen because she's the head of state. Yep. So they're good. But, you know, before I end this podcast, can we just continue with this theme of the royal family being trash? Because I'm not ready to put that topic to bed just yet because guess what else we found out today? A story also involving the Daily Mail or their parent company. It appears Kensington Palace, you know, Will and Kate's stomping ground, had something to do with Megan's letter. You know, that letter that caused a whole lawsuit in the first place. They actually had, not Will and Kate, because it doesn't say that, but, I mean, come on here. (laughs) So not Will and Kate, but Kensington Palace it has been revealed, contributed to the draft of the letter that Megan ultimately sent to her father. Is anybody surprised? Because this is what we've been waiting for. This right here is the main event, if you will. For me anyway. Because there was a guy that went on TV, and I'll try to find it. When Harry and Megan decided that they were going to leave, 
and this lawsuit was really getting underway, there's this guy who hasn't really been all that kind to Megan, saying basically, there's some things that's going to come out if this trial continues forward that is not going to look good for the palace. And I believe this is the beginnings of that. So how this whole thing started, as is my understanding, and y'all can correct me in the comments or fill in the details. So the judge decided that Thomas Markle, even though he was the recipient of the letter, the judge decided that he's not an important enough witness. Like his part is not all that huge to play. So we don't necessarily have to hear from him. Well, A.N.L., who is the parent company of the Mail on Sunday, who Megan is suing, decided that uh, they better start singing like a canary because what they ended up saying was that, or basically implying that Jason Knopf, who was at the time both Prince Harry's and the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge's communication secretary back when everybody was joint right this is this was before the wedding this was before moving to frogmore this is before sussex royal this was before all of that anl submitted that jason knopf and or being vague <laughs> for a reason i'm guessing and or the Kensington Palace communications team contributed to the letter, basically typing one out and then Megan copied the letter. The point is that they contributed to the content of the letter. It's, this is what's being implied. Now, you may ask yourself, well, what is this Jason Knopf doing today in 2020? I'll tell you what, he is the chief executive of Will and Kate's Royal Foundation. So he's in there good. Now, do you find it at all coincidental that whenever Harry or Meghan have been prompted or Harry and Meghan have been prompted to put something on paper that it ends up in the press, whether it is this letter or their plans to leave the royal family after Charles came out with his slim down monarchy picture? Their stuff ends up in the press. Surely they're not the only people in the family who write things down. That can't be no accident. Now, let me read these details here and bear with me because it is a little bit long, but I'll also try to post a picture if you're watching the video. But it says, given the claimant's level of distress surrounding the form, frequency, and content of the media coverage concerning her father... And as a news member of the royal family who wanted to follow protocol, the claimant, Megan, sought advice from two senior members of the royal family on how to best address the situations. Hmm, I wonder which two members they were. In accordance with the advice that she had received from the two members of the royal family, the claimant decided in about the first week of August 2018, okay, so this was after the wedding, to write a private letter to her father in an attempt to get him to stop talking to the press. Once it had been decided that the claimant would write to her father, the claimant informed Mr. Knopf. Mr. Knopf was not only a trusted advisor who had spoken to the claimant's father repeatedly, particularly in the lead up to the wedding, and was aware of the state of his health, but he was also responsible for reporting, as was required by palace protocol, the fact that the claimant was going to write to her father to more senior people in the royal households, all of whom had to be kept apprised of any public-facing issues, the media spectacle surrounding Mr. Markle being one such issue. Like, I know this is an ongoing case, and I'm so glad Megan is deciding not to drop it or has decided not to drop it because it would be much easier you know she could just have that chapter over and done with but y'all gonna learn today is a theme so I'm so impressed with her that she's sticking to her guns because what happened to her somebody somebody is gonna have to answer somehow even if it means embarrassment but y'all gonna know.
y'all got to know what went on behind the scenes. And I think we're starting to see a little bit of that, it's like just like a peek into it. Now, I don't know how much more we're going to see, but my ears are peeled. My tea is hot. My popcorn is popped. And I'm ready. None of this surprises me. I know none of it surprises you. But I am disgusted at how brazen and bold these people are. Now, in another time, this is why I say Kate is one of them. Because she's playing along, it, it, it appears. But at another time, uh, let's say in Diana's time even, this would totally fly because the public would not really be made aware. Not really. Not until later, way later. But we're, again, with social media, we're seeing this in real time. And we're seeing how, remember the whole Christian Jones thing, how when it was revealed that uh, the family was briefing against the Sussexes, and, and, and Dan Wooden had been saying that for a long time. I don't like the guy, but he said it. Uh, briefing against the family, and or the family was briefing against Harry and Meghan, and Christian Jones's boyfriend is good friends with Dan Wooten's friend. And that's how they ended up with the stories all the time ahead of time, including the one about Harry and Meghan deciding to step back from the royal family. And then Harry and Meghan had to release their statement. And then Buckingham Palace was completely caught unawares. And they had that other statement saying, well, we still need to discuss. We didn't know this was coming. They have been trying to take Harry and Meghan down from day one, they knew they were not going to give Megan a chance. And here's an, an interesting comment that was on my Instagram, which I happen to agree with 100%. She said, one rural reporter on his podcast said that this trial was Markle versus Markle. I guess when the judge came out today and said that Thomas Markle was not important to the case, they started throwing people under the bus. If you read carefully, it actually says that Megan wrote the letter on the advice of KP. Little did she know at the time that they were the ones egging on Thomas Markle. My guess is that they had already given the letter to the tabloids and then set up Thomas Markle to give his copy to the tabloid. That way, no direct connection to KP. Perhaps KP told the paper that Megan would not contest it because it was her father. Shout out to Didi Geneve. Thanks for that comment. Little did they know. Megan got a lot of fight in her. And if that was the case and they, they thought that she wouldn't say anything because she was embarrassed because her father was really out here acting a fool, really since before the wedding, if you remember, um, acting a complete fool. They thought that she would just hopefully hope that it quietly goes away while her reputation suffers damage because this guy who could very well be in cahoots with not just the Daily Mail, which we know he was, but Kensington Palace, too. Megan said, oh, no, ma'am, I'm not going to take this line down. And part of me has always wondered whether this idea of there being something more, something deeper something beyond what the public can see was what is driving her to like not let this go. Because eventually, if you play this like this trial right, the truth will come out because she's the one who's filing the lawsuit. And so she's the one who can drop it. If she doesn't want to drop it, girl, the show will go on. And day by day, all those cards are going to have to be flipped over. And we're going to see who was holding what. Child, this is stranger than fiction. And now today's development, more than any other development from Megan having been in the royal family, to see Kensington Palace's name now mentioned, like specifically in these proceedings, it makes perfect sense. Not that it didn't make sense to me before, but it makes perfect sense for her never to bring her baby over there. They might not ever see Archie again. I, I'm going to die on that hill. They may never see that child again. Because I don't know if you remember when he was born, a lot of people, when they were first starting to say the rumblings of, well, Harry needs to just get rid of her and, and, and bring the baby back over here. 
And some people say, oh, Harry shouldn't even bring the baby. Just lead him over there and Harry, you come back. A lot of people, when Archie was born, was talking about, well, the queen actually has custody over Archie anyway. Maybe legally, maybe technically that is true. We don't know that. But one thing we do know is the good sis ain't taking no chances. Archie is also an American. So um, not to necessarily go too far down that road, but Megan, girl, if I was you, I wouldn't bring my baby nowhere near these vipers. And the fact that mama is still just carrying on with her daily business, having her head held high, rubbing elbows with, you know, some of the most powerful people in the world, at least virtually at the moment. Oh, it's so commendable. And this is why we stand. This is why we stand both Harry and Megan and their employer, Archie. So God bless them and everything they do because God knows the royal family did not deserve them. They didn't deserve them. And with that, that is pretty much all I have for today. Thank you guys as always for tuning in. Make sure you find me on all of the socials. Well, most of them. You can find me on Instagram at Sussexet. You can find me on Twitter at Megan Mood. You can find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Sussexet. And I'm designing some badges for the channel for those of you that wanted to sign up for membership for my channel. If I can get those designed by the time I have this video up, I'll actually just go ahead and start opening up the membership for that uh, because I already have an edit that I'm working on. And what better place to release it than Patreon and to the channel first, just to give you guys a peek of it. So uh, thanks as always for your support and for tuning in. You know, you don't have to give an hour of your time, but you do it anyway. And um, as usual, I hope you guys are staying safe taking care of yourselves and your families and wearing your mask, social distancing, washing your hands, being positive, shining your light, living life, singing in the rain, doing all of it, girl. Because life is short. And once it's gone, it's gone. So be well and until next time, peace. I'm a bad bitch. You can't kill me. Kill me.